Well, good morning. My name is Sam Geyer. I am a retired pastor and counselor, and I'm also an elder on session overseeing the ministries of prayer, congregational care, and communications. And I haven't had a chance to welcome you this morning, so welcome to church. <laughs> anyway, um, I want to begin with uh, a kind of a preface to what I'm going to be talking about this morning. Uh, since last fall, we've been reading the Bible cover to cover on the ultimate road trip, which is titled Route 66, a sermon series traveling through the Bible. And this week, we've been reading the Gospel of Luke. Now, Pastor Hannah, when she asked me to preach, she asked if I would focus some of my attention on the parables that we find in Luke. And if you will notice, all of our scriptures for today are a parable. They're the, from the gospel, so they're all, they're all a parable. And the parable that we will hear next is titled The Rich Man and Lazarus. And I chose this one because it's one of my favorite parables. I've preached on this parable one time, and I've read it multiple times. And I just thought it was in, it's a good parable, and I thought I would share it with the church. Now, in this parable, Jesus teaches about the meaning of the resurrection. Jesus, during the time of Jesus, the belief in the resurrection was still a developing process. And Jesus uses this parable to remind his disciples and to remind us that at the end of the parable, when it says, if they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead that he is that, and that Jesus is that someone who rises from the dead and that he is God's son who will be crucified and buried and on the third days he will rise from the dead as our Lord and Savior. So now I'm going to read to you uh, Luke 16 verses 19 to 31 and at the very end of that you will hear what I was just talking about. And so this is the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. There was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen and who feasted sumptuously every day. And at his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus, full of sores, who desired to be, desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. And moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. And then the poor man died and was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom, and the rich man also died and was buried. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham far off and Lazarus with him. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy upon me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, Remember that in you, you in your lifetime received good things. Your good things and Lazarus in like manner evil things. But now he is comforted here and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able to do that. And none may cross from there to us. And he said, Then I beg you, Father, to send him to my father's house. And for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. But Abraham sa said, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And then the rich man said, No, Father Abraham, but if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. And he said to them, If they do not hear Moses and the prophets, Neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. And this is what Jesus is talking about. He's talking about the impact of his resurrection to the lives that we all live. Our next parable is the parable of the lost sheep. And this is found in, in Luke chapter 15, verses 1 to 7. And Luke writes, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to him, and the Pharisees and the scribes murmured, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. 
What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go and go after the one which is lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his same neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. And then Jesus says, Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. This is the word of the Lord. So now we just heard the parable about the lost sheep, which brings up a question, which is what is the reason that sheep get lost? And because I've never spent much time around with sheep, out of curiosity, I googled the question, what is the reason that sheep get lost? And the first thing that Google did was to correct the question. It didn't like the question I asked. And claimed that the real question is, what is the reason that sheep wander off? I lost my place. Which makes sense. Because if the first thing sheep do is to wander off, then that makes it more likely that they will become lost. And then Google offered five reasons that sheep wandered off. The first reason was that sheep became frightened of something and ran away. The second reason was that if one, of, if one sheep wandered off, the rest of the flock might follow it. The third reason was that if the whole flock wandered off, that they might stay together when they become lost. The fourth reason was that they were fleeing a predator such as a wolf or a mountain lion or something. And the fifth reason was that if the sheepdogs and the shepherd did not pay attention to them, then they might wander away as well. So these answers seem to offer a somewhat practical way to think about the reasons that sheep wandered off and got lost. But the Interpreter's Bible Commentary about the Gospel of Luke has a short story that also describes another way for how sheep become lost. And this version is a paraphrase of that story. A farmer came down the lane and seeing a stranger said to him, today I'm going to look for stray sheep. And the stranger was from the city. So he asked, how do they get lost? And the farmer answered, they just nibble themselves lost. They keep their heads down, and they wander from one green tuft of grass to another, and when they come to a hole in the fence, well, they just nibble themselves right through the hole, and then later, they cannot find the hole which can get them back again. And the city man, yeah, I know, and the city man remarked, so they are just like people like every generation of foolish human beings. <laughs> so does this idea of ship nibbling sheep seem to be a mildly humorous comment on the similarities between human behavior and how sheep act? The role of the shepherd is an image that is common in both Judaism and Christianity. And it is one that provides many examples about what it means for how God cares for his people and how God goes to great lengths to find them if they too become lost. Within the Gospel of Luke are a number of parables Jesus told about being lost and then found. But before we look more closely at those parables, will you please join with me in prayer? Good morning, Lord. It is with humble hearts that we come before you on this day of Sabbath to praise and worship you. We are so grateful for your gift of grace, which brings to us your hope, your joy, and your peace. So now I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The Gospel of Luke is filled with much information about who Christ Jesus was. And one of the things to remember is that the Gospel of Luke has many similarities with the Gospel of Matthew. 
This is because of what is called the synoptic tradition, or it's sometimes referred to as the synoptic problem, which is how the similarities and differences between Matthew, Mark, and Luke define how those first three Gospels were developed, how they were written, and what it is that they teach about Jesus. For example, the Gospel of Matthew has a story about the birth of Jesus. So does Luke, but Mark does not. Luke's birth story provides some different information than does Matthew. But through both of them, we hear the full story of the birth of Jesus. Luke teaches us about the birth of John the Baptist, and that is through the story we hear about his parents, who are Zechariah and Elizabeth. But it is in Luke that we also hear most of the story about Mary, who was betrothed to Jesus and who was visited by an angel who said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And this is where we hear how she was visited by an angel and told that she would, quote, conceive in your womb and bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. And when she asked, how shall this be possible since I have no husband, the angel said to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you, and therefore the child to be born will be called Holy, the Son of God. That's another story that we find in the in the Gospel of Luke. So this and many other stories help us to more fully know who Jesus is. So let us look at a couple of more parables that we find in the Gospel of Luke. A few minutes ago, we heard a short story about how sheep nibble themselves into wandering away. And Luke 15 verses 1 to 2 sets the stage for what Jesus teaches in this parable. And these opening verses guide what Jesus said about what it means to search for those who were lost. Luke writes, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, <coughs> excuse me, murmured, saying, <clears throat> This man receives sinners and eats with them. The interpreter's Bible commentary <clears throat> says that the Pharisees believe that for Jesus, quote, to receive sinners was bad enough, but to eat with them was worse, for that meant to choose sinners as his friends. And that was because he broke bread with them. <clears throat> it also tells us that the publicans were the tax collectors who were, who were Israelites who worked for the Roman government and collected taxes from their oppressed countrymen, oftentimes with extra fees attached. And that the sinners were people who were careless of the religious law. In other words, they were people who did not follow or who were resistant to following the many rules and laws that were enforced by the religious leaders of Israel. And a couple of weeks ago, Pastor Hannah commented on the mitzvot, which is 613 rules of Israel that the people were supposed to follow. So given all of this information about this situation, what did Jesus do? Luke says, so then, Jesus told them this parable. So he was telling this parable to the, to the, to the Pharisees and to everybody else as well. What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he has lost one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that which is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays, on, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my lost sheep, which was lost. So how do we understand this parable? What does this image of Christ as shepherd mean for our own life of faith. The interpreter's Bible commentary also says, no picture of Jesus was more dear to the early church than this understanding, that he is the good shepherd. It is the theme of inscriptions on early Christian seals and writings, and it occurs and reoccurs 
in the portrayals found in the catacombs. And it continues, Jesus as shepherd was, has given deeper meaning to such passages as Isaiah 40, verse 11, which says, He will feed his shock, his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom and gently lead those that are with young. The parable of the lost sheep closes with these words. Jesus said, just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. So what does the phrase, there will be more joy in heaven, look like? Well, one answer to that question can be found in Luke chapter 2, verses 8 to 20, when Luke proclaims, and in that region were the shepherds out in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with fear. And the angel said to them, Be not afraid, for behold, I bring you good news of a great joy, which will come to all the people. For to you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord, and this will be a sign for you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace among men with whom he is well pleased. Is that what the joy of heaven sounds like? Is that what the joy of heaven looks like? That in, the one moment, in that one moment, God planted within the soul of his son all the joy and the love that came from the spirit of God's own heart. Is that what we too remember about the coming of God's Savior that is meant for us? That the Son of God is the good shepherd for all. And so there's another parable about being lost that probably strikes closer to ourselves than we sometimes want to admit. And that is the parable of the lost son, or as it is also known, the parable of the prodigal son. Webster's New Collegiate Dictionary says that the word prodigal means to be recklessly extravagant or characterized by wasteful spending or one who spends and gives lavishly and foolishly. So whichever way this parable is titled, what does it teach us about what it means to be lost and then found? The following is a partial paraphrase of the parable of the lost son, and we find that in Luke chapter 15, verses 11 to 22, or 32, 32. There was a wealthy man who had two sons, and the youngest son went to his father and said he wanted his inheritance, which the father gave to him. And the youngest son took his money, and he went to the big city, and he spent it on lavish living, and probably illicit living as well. But eventually the money ran out, and he found himself to be penniless, feeding pigs, and not making even enough to eat. So he decided to go home and beg his father's forgiveness and hope that his father would at least feed him. But his father, seeing his son in the distance, raced to get to him, whom he embraced and had a celebration with all of his own friends and his son's friends. Because the father said, For this my son, whom I thought was dead, is alive. He was lost and is found. But what about the other son? Luke writes, Now his elder son was in the field, and as he came he drew and, and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants and asked what this meant. And he said to him, Your brother has come, and your father has killed the fatted calf, because he has received him safe and sound. But the eldest son became angry and refused to go in. His father came out and begged him to enter, but he answered, Father, these, these, these many years I have served you, and I never 
disobeyed your command. Yet you never gave me a young kid or a young goat that I might make merry with my own friends. But when this son of yours came, who has devoured your living with harlots, you killed for him the fatted calf. And the father said to the eldest son, you are always with me, and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to make merry and be glad, for this your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and then is found. So what is this parable of Jesus teaching us about what it means to be lost and then found? When the pastor's Bible study met on Thursday, we talked about this story, and we were struck by how the ending is open-ended, which felt like that the ending left us with a sense of incompletion because it does not offer a resolution, but instead leaves us with more questions than answers which does make us ponder its meaning. But the Interpreter's Bible Commentary is a, in the, in the Interpreter's Bible Commentary is a comment about two of the words that came from this parable, which are the word dead and the word alive. It says, this is a new use of these two words because up to now, they were used mainly to describe what happens to the body when the heart stops beating so that we are either alive or that we are dead. But it says, the New Testament insists on a far deeper meaning for them. And it quotes John chapter 5, verse 24, when Jesus says, Truly I say to you, he who hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but he has passed from death into life. And it goes and said, and it goes on and says, for real death only comes when the soul is lost. Now, as we are often aware, being a faithful follower of Jesus Christ is not always easy. And that may be because sometimes, just like sheep, we have a wandering faith. It may mean that sometimes we become jealous or judgmental, just like the elder brother. Or for a while, we lose our way, <clears throat> excuse me, just like the youngest son who eventually came to his senses and turned to seek his father, whom he hoped would at least give him something to eat. So it is in those wandering times when we also remember. So is it in those wandering times when we also remember the, the love the father has had for his lost and wayward son? Or do we remember that the God, what that God, that that love that God has for us, which comes to us through the grace and mercy of His Son, who is the Good Shepherd? <clears throat> the Gospel of Luke is filled with many parables about Jesus, and it's also filled with stories about the birth and life of Jesus, about His own interactions with the Pharisees and the people of Israel, and the story about the death upon a cross and about when on the third day he rose from the dead and is Christ Jesus the Messiah, the risen Son of God. It is in and through our faith in Christ Jesus who, when we nibble ourselves away with, from him, seeks and finds us and carries us home. So as you go from here today, keep in mind the many parables of Jesus who taught us what it means to know him who is the good shepherd for all of us. Amen. Now, will you please join with me in the prayers of the people? Good morning, Lord. We give you thanks for this day. We ask that you be with the family of John and Kathy Owen as they mourn the loss of their grandson, Chris Gad. Keep them safe as they are traveling to Seattle and be with all of the family through the next few days and help them to know your loving embrace. We ask that you be with us here who pray for this family and for one another and who may have experienced the death of someone they too love. Lord, we give thanks for Pastor Sarah Benedetti and, and we ask that you be with her as she prepares to leave her home in New Jersey and following her call to come here to be our associate pastor for youth and families. We ask that you be with those who are ill 
or in the hospital or in the medical facility and that they know your healing grace. And Lord Jesus, we ask that you bring peace to our world and that the leaders of this world turn to you so they can make peace for all of us. And now we bring to you the prayer taught to us by your Son. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.